On their last night together, which John remembers as being the Wednesday before Thanksgiving, John says he made the boys their favorite meal, fried chicken, and a cake to celebrate Andrew's birthday. John said they all ate dinner together at the table, then watched a karate movie before going to bed. Hello everybody and welcome back to my channel. Thank you for joining me for another true crime video and today we are covering part two of the Skelton Brothers case. In part one, we discussed everything leading up to Alexander, Andrew, and Tanner Skelton going missing the day after Thanksgiving in 2010. We went over the initial stages of what was a search and rescue mission that turned into a murder investigation. We also talked about how the boy's father, John Skelton, was arrested and charged with three counts of parental kidnapping. So if you haven't seen that video yet, the link is in the description box, and I suggest you watch that first since one comes before two. Today, we are going to start with the family of John Skelton and how it might be possible that the apple didn't fall far from the tree. Before we dive in, however, let's have a word from our sponsor, and the sponsor for today's video is Scentbird, which I didn't think I was going to like as much as I do. In fact, I now love this service. Scentbird allows you to try and test out so many perfumes and scents from over 600 brands for a fraction of the price. Once you find a favorite, you can order it each month or you can even mix it up and try different scents out. Scentbird even offers other products such as skincare and makeup. And if you feel like Scentbird has sent you enough perfumes to last you a while, you can skip any month without any penalties. All you have to do is browse through the site, choose the fragrance you want to test drive for the month, and it will be delivered to your door with free shipping. You can even upgrade to add an additional two or three cents to your order if you're really trying to narrow down your new favorite. Scentbird partners with top brands such as Prada, Gucci, and Versace, and they also offer indie brands like Glossier, Nest, and Toka. They are not knockoffs. They are 100% genuine scents. You can discover new scents by taking a simple quiz on scentbird.com, and based on the answers from this quiz as well as your previous purchases and rated fragrances, Scentbird will surprise you with something that they think you'll love. Scentbird offers fragrances for both men and and women and you will receive a free refillable case with your first order. When I say I didn't think I would like Scentbird as much as I did, it's because I've been wearing the same perfume since I was 15 years old, Clinique Happy, and I was very, well, well, happy with it. I was always afraid to buy a new bottle of perfume because it's a big investment and if you end up not liking it, you feel like you just wasted 50 bucks on something that you're never gonna use again. Through Scentbird, I have now discovered two scents that I love as much as Happy, and I get a kick out of seeing my husband's face light up every time I'm wearing one and he notices that it's a different scent. My mom mentioned it to me when I saw her last week that she noticed I had a new perfume on. Everybody's been used to be wearing the same perfume for over 15 years, so it's kind of cool to throw them a curveball. I especially like smelling my own perfume on myself because I've been wearing Happy for so long I stopped smelling it on myself. And the two that I'm obsessed with right now are you or someone like you. And that scent is by Itat Libre Diange. Did I say that right? <laughs> First of all, the name reminded me of one of my favorite Matchbox 20 albums and the scent is Oh my God, it's so good. It's so unique, it's so interesting. I cannot get enough of it. It's got some floral notes to it, but the one note and the one scent that really stands out to me the most, it's almost like a spearmint or a peppermint smell, but mixed with the rose and the other herbs, it's truly intoxicating. And I also like Happy Heart by Clinique. It still gives me that bright citrusy vibe that I loved about the original Happy, but the, the addition of the light florals and the cucumber makes it smell clean and fresh, like you just stepped out of the shower. Scentbird also sent me the fragrance Rebecca Minkoff, which I don't think I would have picked myself since some of the notes in there are like tobacco and patchouli and I'm usually a little iffy on those, but in this perfume, the way the different scents are mixed together works so well and I was really happy to be able to try it out. Lastly, the refillable cases you can get with these perfumes are amazing because they come in all different colors, they're cute, and there's nothing to open or mess with when you wanna use it. Like when you get perfume samples from Sephora and you're always trying to like open them and recork them and then they, it spills all over over the place. Using these cases is so fun and so easy. You just twist to reveal the spritzer and twist again to put it neatly away, ready to toss into your pocket, purse, or drawer. If you're interested in checking Scentbird out and following me into a whole new world of fragrance and magic, click the link in the description box and use code HARLOW30 for 30% off. That's just $10 for your first month. 
That's H-A-R-L-O-W-E 30. You can also download their app for iOS and Android, which is a convenient way to browse for perfumes and rate your previous choices. Thank you so much to Scentbird for sponsoring this video. Thank you to all of you out there who watch the videos, watch the sponsors, understanding that they're necessary to keep the channel afloat. And don't forget to check out the link in the description box and use code HARLOW30 if you're interested in trying Scentbird out. Let's dive right into the video. So it seems like John Skelton may have had a complicated relationship with his parents. His father, William Skelton, and his mother, Roxanne Skelton, did come to see him while he was being held at the Lucas County Jail in December of 2010. They met with him for 30 minutes and then walked out of the prison telling the reporters and the media and everybody standing outside that they believed every single thing he said. They even went so far as to say that they believed that those three boys were safe. When questioned on whether or not they had asked where the boys were, his parents responded that he didn't tell them and they didn't want him to. They claimed that the massive search efforts were unnecessary and that they were disappointed the media was only reporting on one side of the story, Tanya's side. And this will become a pattern with John and his family, constantly accusing everyone of being biased and not talking about John's side of the story. But when they're approached for interviews and invited to explain explain and talk about their side of the story, they refuse. His, uh, he's got, he went to the authorities in Marinci. They ignored him and wouldn't do anything to help him. And so he did what he felt he had to do. Might and that's not, all we have. Might not have been the best judgment, but it was a positive decision. And I, like I told him, I got to support you on that. Do you feel your grandsons are still alive? Oh, yes. Yes, 100%. After talking to him, yeah, I, I do. What does John say to you personally? I won't, I won't even dis, disclose any of that because I did in confidentiality with him, allowing for the idea that the system is monitored, recorded, and I got enough information out of him that them boys, they ain't no problem, them boys. What do you believe, William? What do I believe? I believe there's some real faulty uh, things in the system that aren't helping both sides equally the system wants to go their one little plan thing of maybe say dead bodies and doesn't want to look at the other side of the story. As your, as a father, what were your emotions like when you first saw him on the screen like that in custody? Son, this is one hell of a way to get Marenzi out of the map. Then I sit back and listen to him. Nah, he didn't do that stuff. No, no, no. I've got my own personal opinions about, you know, that I formed way back then. I wouldn't even discuss anyway because that could buy, you know, violate his trust. But that's just some of my background training of looking at stuff. Physical rights are hard. I can't tell you. John's mother, Roxanne Skelton, told reporters she believed her son when he told her that Tanya was abusing their sons, saying, quote, he took those boys out of harm's way, and I respect my son, end quote. Why? Because he took those boys out of harm's way, and I respect my son. He loves his, he loves his children, and I respect my son for doing just that, taking his boys out of harm's way. According to Tanya, John's parents didn't always have so much respect for him, so much faith in him. His parents lived in Jacksonville, Florida, but many of their family members had moved to and settled in Michigan, including John. And sometimes John's parents would drive all the way from Florida to Michigan to visit family, and they'd be in town for days before they even called John to let him know they were there. One time, they came and left without even calling him or stopping by to see their son or their grandsons. I haven't been as, you know, I live down there in Florida, I've got a business down there, so I'm taking up quite a bit of that, and then I'm over in the Bahamas quite a bit working and stuff, so I don't get up here all the time, and they don't get down there that much. When did you get here? Did you get here last oh, I've night? I've been here, no, I've been here a week or so. Okay. When was the last time you talked to your grandsons, even over the phone? Gosh, I don't know, it's been a while. Additionally, early on in their marriage, Roxanne had gotten into a fight with her son, so she'd ripped up all the pictures of her grandson, Andrew, who was John and Tanya's only child at that point, and mailed the ripped pieces of these pictures to John. When the kids went missing, Roxanne and William drove up to visit John behind bars, 
but they did not help with the search for the boys. Not at all, nor did they reach out to Tanya or anyone in her family ever. Let the truth be known. Let it be known. But in my opinion, what's the most telling of all of this is they claimed publicly to believe John, just like Scott Peterson's mother and Chris Watts' mother and Lori Vallow's mother. In the face of overwhelming evidence to the contrary, they were willing and able to look a reporter straight in the eye and say they believed his bizarre story. And in my opinion, this shines a light on how John may have been raised with a complete lack of accountability. And this may have set him down the path to narcissism and the belief that he could do no wrong. And if he did do something wrong, it was never going to be his fault. There are a few reasons why John Skelton may have gone off the deep end and done something to his children. Tanya believes that he had lost touch with reality, immersing himself in a world of fantasy RPG video games that he would play constantly, sometimes for 12 hours at a time. Tanya did remember a time in their lives together that John was a good father and she believed that he loved their kids. He spent time with them, taught them things. They were building a tree house together. But when he lost his trucking job, he became more isolated, more withdrawn. And the months before everything went down, it was getting worse and worse. Tanya said he would retreat into his home office with his beer and his cigarettes and play video games featuring druids and witches on his PC, not looking up for hours. Now we've talked about this kind of stuff in videos before. I don't believe that video games causes um, people, especially grown adults, to lose touch with reality. I don't blame video games for violence and things. As a person who likes playing video games, I, I understand the appeal. I understand the desire to disconnect from the real world and kind of immerse yourself into a fantasy world. But I do understand that the most people come out of that fantasy world and re-enter the real world with no problems. In fact, I'm a little bit jealous that he was able to play video games for 12 hours at a time because I would love, love 12 hours of uninterrupted time right now to play Zelda Breath of the Wild because I am trying so hard, so hard to beat Calamity Ganon. So I'm not sure how much stock I would put into the video game thing unless he was already a mentally unstable person, which is possible. Another more obvious motive, in my opinion, is revenge which is a tale as old as time. Many times in divorce cases like this, we see people feel as if they have their back to the wall. John may have felt out of control, knowing he was losing Tanya, who for years after, he professed that he still loved. He may have felt that the only way he could hurt her was by taking her children away from her. Tanya had always wanted to be a mother and had made the decision to stay home and raise her kids instead of pursuing a career because she felt nothing could ever be more rewarding than being a parent. Anyone who knew her verified that her sons were the most important thing in the world to her and when you're really mad at someone, you try to get them where it, it hurts. It's vindictive, it's disgusting, but it happens all the time and John Skelton would have known that the only way to really hurt Tanya was to go through her sons. In fact, John had made a very incriminating statement after Tanya filed for divorce, which showed just how resentful and angry he really was. He said, quote, she can take those divorce papers and she can go to the park and push them around. She can push them on a swing. That's as close as I ever want her to get to those kids again, end quote. So essentially, this is after he's, you know, made the, the kids disappear. She files for divorce. We're going to talk about that in a minute. She files for divorce and the court is asking him, you know, where are your kids? And he pretty much is like, well, you know, she's got her divorce papers now and she can take those to the park and she can play with those and she can love those because she's never getting those kids back. Jack Levin, a professor and co-director of the Brudnick Center on Violence and Conflict at Northeastern University in Boston, commented on the case. He said there were several catastrophic blows in cases where a father kills his family, including loss of a job, a failed marriage, or an ongoing custody battle. John Skelton was facing all three of these. Levin said, quote, if a husband and or father feels the need to control, if he sees himself as the breadwinner and as the alpha parent, then he may decide to take matters into his own hands and determine the fate of his own children, end quote. 
And we've seen this illustrated in cases before. The uh, Josh Powell case is the one that comes to mind. The Timothy Pitson case is another that comes to mind. It's one of those really toxic sorts of beliefs. If I can't have them, nobody can. The police had no proof that John Skelton had ended the lives of his three sons, so they couldn't charge him with murder, but they did add three new charges each of kidnapping and unlawful imprisonment on top of the three counts of parental kidnapping that John was already facing. These new charges carried a sentence of life in prison, so John was offered a plea deal. The prosecution would drop the charges of kidnapping and parental kidnapping if he pleaded no contest to the charges of unlawful imprisonment, which basically basically meant he was accepting responsibility for illegally taking his sons in exchange for dismissing kidnapping charges. This may make you feel some sort of way, like John Skelton is getting one hell of a deal and actually getting away with murder, but some legal experts believe the prosecution made a smart decision. We've seen prosecutors get a little cocky and try to overkick their coverage, going for charges against defendants that are based on circumstantial evidence and are going to be hard to prove to a jury. The prosecution team in the Casey Anthony case did just this, and as a result, she was acquitted by a jury who, upon examination of the evidence, realized there was not legally enough to charge her with murder. And this whole situation with uh, the Skelton brothers, it, it actually happened right after the Casey Anthony trial. So I wouldn't be surprised or say that it was a stretch to believe the DA in John's case might have used the Florida case as a cautionary tale for what not to do. If John Skelton had been convicted of kidnapping, he could have faced life in prison. But there was also a very good chance he could have been found not guilty, and then he would have been in the wind. No justice would have been served. Additionally, if at a later time the remains of these three boys were found and they wanted to bring murder charges against him, the defense could have pointed to the fact that he was acquitted of uh, kidnapping charges. The boy's mother, Tanya Zuvers, fully supported the decision made by law enforcement with a family spokesperson saying, quote, there is a sense of discouragement that John will not receive the sentence we believe he deserves. However, our focus is still on Andrew, Alexander, and Tanner, and this will not be over until the boys are home, end quote. So John Skelton took the plea deal, which means there's not going to be a trial, but his sentencing hearing was scheduled for September 15th, 2011. But first, there was the little matter of a divorce to see to. Tanya refused to refer to John Skelton as her husband or the father of her children, calling him only by his legal name and even sometimes referring to him as the defendant. It was time to make it official and cut the ties of marriage that still connected Tanya to John Skelton. During the hearing, John represented himself, acting as his own lawyer and questioning Tanya on the stand. During today's court proceedings, Skelton acted as his own attorney and even asked his wife while on the stand if she thought the boys were alive. The judge then cut him off and said that that line of questioning would not be allowed. Morency police are treating this case as a homicide, but Skelton maintains that the boys are safe and in the care of an organization. Which I feel is absolutely pure torture. For her, I don't even know if they should have allowed that. I don't know if they even legally cannot allow it, but can you imagine that your husband or your wife, I know we got some more guys here now, the, the guy membership in the channel is raising, so imagine your husband or your wife um, takes your children and disappears them from you. And then when you try to divorce him, you're forced to sit on the stand and be questioned by this person who is the reason you no longer have your children with you. Absolute torture. I can't even imagine. Uh, John Skelton told the court that he was a born-again Christian and he had faith that his children were safe. He only wished that people didn't think he had harmed them, claiming that he knew he was going to heaven. As to his answer of where he was between the afternoon of November 25th and November 26th when his phone pinged by Holiday City in Ohio, he claims he wasn't in Ohio, but his phone was, and he couldn't say more than that. The trial was presided over by Judge Margaret No, who we did discuss and talk about a little bit in part one, and she was having none of John's nonsense. He actually requested joint custody of his children that were no longer around, informing Tanya that she would never see her sons again if she was granted full custody of them. So he's basically trying to threaten not only Tanya, but the court as well. If you grant her full custody, I'm going to keep those kids hidden. That's what I got from it in my interpretation. To me, it was a veiled or not so veiled threat. 
The hearing lasted only about an hour before Judge Noe had granted Tanya full custody and her divorce, but Judge Margaret Noe was not done with John yet, as she would be the judge on his sentencing hearing a few months later. So basically, the divorce hearing was first Judge No granted Tanya her divorce and custody of her missing children. And, you know, she looked over at John Skelton and she was like, I'll see you later. On September 15th, John Skelton sat again in the courtroom ready to hear how long he would be confined to prison. Judge No went over every version of John Skelton's crazy stories, illustrating to everyone listening just how unbelievable they all were, just how clearly guilty this man was, just how much he was lying. Tanya spoke to the court about her sons, saying, quote, I worry about them. Are they safe, warm, being fed, and most importantly, being loved? Not one minute of the day for the past nine months, two weeks, and six days have the boys been from my thoughts. I worry about them. Are they safe, warm, being fed, and most importantly, being loved? My fear is that the answer to these questions are no, because no one will ever be able to love those three precious boys like I do. Judge No informed John Skelton that she felt his stories about this underground child saving group were ridiculous, saying, quote, because of you, Andrew, Alexander, and Tanner have been silenced. We don't know where they are. End quote. Assistant prosecutor Douglas Harting asked John if he had a statement to make about his missing sons, saying, quote, The only question left is, are you man enough to tell the truth once and for all? End quote. John was not man enough, responding to this only by saying, I would have done things differently if I felt that the system didn't fail me, if I felt the people who were supposed to have done something didn't choose friendship over their duty. That's it. And that was it, right? That was all he had to say. He didn't give them any more indication to where those kids might be. He didn't say he was sorry for the pain he had caused everybody, his community, his ex-wife, her family. Because John Skelton, he's not at fault for anything. It's the system's fault, right? Even if he didn't want to admit he killed those boys, even if he's still going with the story that he gave them to some secret Amish Avengers group, which is admittedly a stupid decision, even if it's a real story. I mean, who hands over their kids to complete strangers, especially when you have no idea where this group resides or how to contact them? He still can't take responsibility for that dumb decision, blaming the system that failed him by taking custody away from him after he kidnapped his kids and just secret them away across state lines. I mean, did Lori Vallow read the John Skelton guidebook on how to get away with murder before she committed her own dark deeds? Because the narrative is very similar. For the charges that John was facing, the sentencing guidelines were 43 to 86 months in prison. So that was standard, that was suggested. So anywhere from roughly two to seven years. But Judge No said, I can do better. She sentenced John to 10 to 15 years in a federal penitentiary. You have refused to answer me truthfully. These three children remain missing. Judge Margaret Noe eviscerates John Skelton in court, calling him deplorable and duplicitous before handing down her sentence. You are hereby sentenced to the Michigan Department of Corrections to serve 120 to 180 months. To explain her decision, Judge No said, quote, there are substantial and compelling reasons to justify departure. The long-term effect of this crime has not been measured adequately by the guidelines. End quote. She went on to explain how this action that John had done had sent out a ripple effect of shockwaves. And these shockwaves had rocked the world of not only the boy's mother, but the entire town. No stated, quote, the guidelines do not account for the loss, which is more like that suffered by families of murder victims. Most people could not even imagine the pain of not knowing if your children are in good care, dead or alive. It's deplorable, end quote. And I agree with her. I think the worst kind of torture you can face in life is to be the parent of a missing child. There is no funeral, no closure. The sliver of hope you have that your child may still be alive is outweighed by the daily trauma of the unknown, the wondering. You wake up in the morning and wonder where your child is. You wonder if they were fed breakfast or if they're locked in some dark basement being tortured or harmed, starving, cold, and crying for you. Every time you have a moment of peace or comfort, 
you'd feel guilty because every minute you're wondering if your baby is comfortable or at peace or if they're being hurt and abused while you sit in the safety of your home. You don't sleep because every single second of every single day you're wondering, wondering, knowing that there's a good chance your child's no longer alive. But if they are, they're most likely not being cared for. They're probably crying for their mother and their father. They're wondering why you haven't come to save them yet. They're wondering why this is happening. They're confused as to why you always promised you would keep them safe, but now you're letting this happen to them. It's unimaginable. Unimaginable. John Skelton's court-appointed attorney, John Glazer, told the court that his client was just as upset about the current situation as anyone. He loved his kids, and he looks at their pictures in his little jail cell every day. And of course, we can't have a John Skelton interaction without a change to his story. John's lawyer, John Glazer, told the judge that John Skelton now claimed he had never tried to kill himself. He just broken his foot. When the judge asked how John had broken his foot, John's lawyer informed the court that his client would prefer to not reveal that information. He didn't want to reveal the facts on how he broke his foot. And John also had a lot of problems with the police report, finding issue with the words false information used in that report. And just to show you how he was not a liar, he started talking about Joanne Taylor again, a fabricated woman that no one had ever met or heard of, that the FBI and the police had been searching for for years and had never found her. And he just insisted she was real. She was real. They'd actually built a website together. As to the alleged claims of child abuse that John Skelton had made against his now ex-wife Tanya, the prosecuting attorney Douglas Harting read him up and down. Harting pointed out that the first lawyer John had retained in Florida had been a former prosecuting attorney and had formerly served as a probate judge. A probate judge is a person who hears cases and makes decisions for children and families based on what's best for their welfare. So why wouldn't John have just talked to this lawyer about the abuse of his sons instead of kidnapping them and handing them over to complete strangers? He never made a report to the Morenci or the state police. He says the system let him down, but he never tried to utilize the system. So how could the system have let him down? It's not as if he went to the police, reported the abuse, there was an investigation, and he still, after all of that, felt justice hadn't been served. He didn't go down any of the proper avenues, ever. And hadn't John told his aunt that he didn't want his wife Tanya to have the boys toothbrushes and winter coats because he didn't want her to have the memories. To me, that suggests someone who's controlling and vindictive, someone who's more interested in hurting their significant other than anything else. I can't think of anything that is more entitled and selfish and manipulative than trying to change, control, or police another person's memories. Doug Harding told John Skelton, quote, the disrespect you've done to your son's lives is immeasurable. All the evil that you have done to your sons will never take away the memories, will never take away their hearts, never take away their souls, end quote. Judge No followed this up by saying, quote, Your explanations have been ridiculous, albeit more sad than anything else. Police and FBI reports are wrought with your worthless explanations. Just plain lies promoting your deception. You have said you do not want the mother of these children to have memories of her sons. Your actions are wrong. Your actions are criminal and you have failed. Their mother, their family, the school children, the community of Morenci will never lose the memory of these three children. They will lose their memory of you. End quote. Some parting words came from prosecutor Doug Harding after the sentence was handed down. He looked at John Skelton and told him, quote, Don't get too comfortable in prison. These gentlemen are continuing to investigate this case. They're getting pretty good at it. Hopefully, they'll be back to get you very, very soon. End quote. In 2012, John Skelton appealed his sentence, claiming that Judge No should not have gone against the state guidelines, but this appeal was rejected. I mean, he shot his shot, right? I can't blame him for that, but once again, it does show a lack of accountability. He doesn't think he did anything to belong behind bars. He thinks that it's a travesty of justice that he's there behind bars, especially for 10 to 15 years. He tried it. It didn't work. In November of 2012, age progression photos were released to show what Alexander, Andrew, and Tanner might look like two years older. The images were very difficult for their mother to see. 
obviously. Tanya Zuvers gathered with friends, family, and community members that same month at Wakefield Park in Morency, where there was a dedication ceremony for her three sons and a plaque was unveiled in their honor. She said when everything was over, if there was a positive outcome, the plaque would come back home with her and her sons, and if there wasn't a positive outcome, it would become part of their headstone. Police Chief Larry Weeks released a statement in November of 2012 as well, saying that he believed the boys were no longer alive, but the investigation was very much still alive. In December of 2012, the Morency Police Department partnered with John Walsh on his show, John Walsh Investigates. According to journalist Lynn Thompson, author of the book 78 Minutes, which was written about the Skelton Brothers case, he was given access to the show's soundstage and was able to talk to Walsh, who expressed his wishes to waterboard John Skelton. John Walsh believed that someone knew something besides John, and his hope was that this someone would come forward and give information once they saw the show, saying, quote, if they're afraid to call the police, they can call us. They know we don't track the calls. All we need is that one tip, end quote. The show brought in many more tips, but none of them ended up leading to anything substantial. Some of these tips led back to that Ohio region where John Skelton's phone pinged on that fateful night. Holiday City, Ohio is exit 13 off the Ohio Turnpike. You know these towns where they say you can drive through and never even know you were there. That's Holiday City. At any given time, it is home to under 100 permanent residents. Now in Holiday City, there's a Ramada Inn. And behind that Ramada Inn, there is a, uh, a retention pond. So basically a man-made pond. And a missing person was discovered in that, that retention pond in 2010. The only problem with this investigation and this missing person being discovered was law enforcement had searched that pond using side scan sonar equipment since it was behind the hotel that the man had been staying at and they found nothing when they searched with the sonar. 52 days later, his body washed up. Lynn Thompson wrote that book called 76 Minutes about the skeleton case and he believes that if sonar technology was able to miss the body of a full-grown adult male, it's possible they may have missed the boys earlier that same year. According to Lynn Thompson's book, the disappearance of the Skelton brothers was the reason the sonar equipment had been purchased in the first place. But the company that sold the equipment to the police department remembers that they had bought the $4,000 system, but they hadn't purchased the training to go along with it. The police divers ended up learning how to use this very sophisticated equipment by setting it up in a small backyard pond and searching for golf balls. Dennis Waters, who's the CEO of Team Waters Sonar Search and Rescue, feels that knowing how to use the equipment and understanding how it works are two very different things. He said, quote, The problem is that not everybody looks like a body. You have to look at what doesn't belong to be more successful. The settings are everything. 90% of the battle, if you do it right. The other 10% is interpretation, end quote. Waters remembers one search where they were attempting to find four children. Three of them looked just like rocks, but the texture was different. Someone who was not proficient with the sonar might see the body, think it's a rock, and move on. This sonar technology was used in the 2010 search for the Skeleton Brothers to comb through that retention pond in Holiday City, as well as three ponds at the Lazy River campgrounds. Gene Ralston, a sonar operator who works with the United States Geological Service and assists with FBI investigations, looked at the scans taken from these searches and concluded, without being told, exactly what equipment had been used, stating that he wouldn't be surprised if a body had been missed using that specific unit in the bodies of water that they were searching. The unit in question is called a hummingbird, and it's good for fishing and, you know, sort of shallow water, but Ralston claims it's not true sonar. It will ping and listen, but it's not continuous. If the boat it's attached to is going too fast, it's likely to miss something. The boat's speed needs to be about two miles per hour, no more, or the resulting images will just kind of melt into each other. Additionally, this sonar was mounted on the boat that they were using to search for the boys, but Ralston believes it would have been better if they had towed it behind the boat so that the sonar wasn't picking up on any like boat noises or things like that. Now it is worth noting that the speed of the boat used in the searches has been redacted from the police files, so we don't really know how fast the boat was going or if it was staying under two miles per hour. 
Ralston also believes that the search parties may not have been exactly knowledgeable on what they would be looking for. They'd be searching for something that resembled a body, but it's more likely that the boys would have been wrapped in something, as most intentional body disposals are. Across the street from the retention pond is a cell phone tower, the very same phone tower that John Skelton's cell phone pinged at on November 26, 2010. So is it possible that John Skelton did something to his sons and disposed of them in that retention pond behind the Ramada Inn. It is possible. It's also possible they're not there at all, but if he did dispose of them, he was somebody who would have been knowledgeable about how to have done so without them emerging later. He was in the army. He was good with knots. He was good with, you know, survival type things. And he most likely would have known that if he was going to put them into a body of water, he would have to weigh them down in order for them to not, you know, emerge at a later time. Now, I want to talk quickly about this secret shadow society, the Amish Avengers, that John Skelton claimed his sons are being hidden away with. I'm not discounting that such groups exist, as it has been proven that they do, and they are active. It's my belief, however, that the Skelton brothers are not with such a group, nor were they ever. Faye Yeager is a woman who for years has been the force behind an underground network that hid more than 1,000 abused children from a legal system that would deliver them right back into the hands of their abusers. The legitimacy or value of such groups is debatable. Some believe they're doing good work. Some believe they're kind of ignoring the law and interfering with the legal system and essentially kidnapping children without actual proof or evidence that they're being abused. That's not what we're here to debate. That's not what we're here to discuss. I don't know enough about these groups, so I definitely have to do more research before I felt comfortable um, engaging in any kind of debate about it. However, I do want to talk about Faye because she's familiar with the inner workings of these groups. So her perspective is valuable to examine here in order to compare with the way John Skelton's alleged group worked. Faye's network was called the Children of the Underground, and she formally started helping parents in 1987. They used fake documents, wigs, disguises, and instructed those who wanted their help to not look anything like themselves, leave everything behind that might remind them of their past life, including pictures, credit cards, driver's licenses. Forget who you are, they would be instructed. Faye has spoken on the Skelton case, saying, quote, I'm telling you that no network I work with or know would do such a thing. There's something wrong there. I'd be very worried about the children, end quote. Faye says that if the boys were with such a group, John would have the information of a contact person. And these networks do not take children without a guardian's involvement. They would also require medical records or court documents that supported abuse claims. Another point I want to mention is that 2020 or 60 Minutes did a piece on these underground networks not long before the Skelton brothers went missing, and it's more than likely John Skelton saw this on TV and figured he had his perfect alibi, something no law enforcement agency could ever prove or disprove since they were so secretive and they were basically created to stay hidden and stay underground. I also don't think it's completely crazy that John Skelton may have been following Casey Anthony's case because even though her trial didn't start until the summer of 2011, it was very public about the stories she was telling and what she was saying to police about where her daughter was for quite a while before that. And if you remember correctly, Casey Anthony kept telling everybody that she'd given her daughter to Zanny the Nanny, this uh, group of people who were taking care of her um, for Casey while Casey was working, etc. And that this group of people had kind of made off with her daughter. And there was really no way to prove otherwise. In 2013, the Michigan State Police took over the investigation. They had been involved since the start, and they had more resources than the smaller Morency Police Department. In October of that same year, a man named Robert Jameson was sentenced to two years in prison for lying to police in relation to the Skelton case. This 50-year-old man told police he had talked to John Skelton shortly before the boys disappeared in 2010, and that John had told him he was planning on placing his kids with an organization to save them from their mother. 
father. He later admitted to making the whole thing up, saying that he was just trying to help. In 2014, another round of age progression photos were released to show what Alexander would look like at age 11, what Andrew would look like at age 13, and what Tanner would look like at the age of 9. In 2015, with no new leads and John Skelton still sitting in the Bellamy Creek Correctional Facility in Iona, Michigan, still not revealing anything, Tanya was holding on to her hope, and she held a candlelight vigil on the fifth anniversary of her son's disappearance in a park that they had enjoyed playing at. Tanya sat there in her living room, talked about her boys, and never shed a tear. She says it's important, she thinks, to stay strong. Because you don't know. Are the boys out there? Are they going to see? Are they going to hear? And the loving, caring sons that I raise to the ages, they don't, they don't like mom to cry and be upset. They want mom, this is who they know. This is what they want, you know? So I don't, because someday we will be back together. I will find them. It may not be until I'm buried but I will find them and I don't want them to think that I was just a shell of a person in our time apart. In 2016, more age progression photos were released, created by the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children. In September of 2017, a new lead brought investigators 1,800 miles away from Marenzi to Missoula, Montana. A tiny two-bedroom beige cottage was being cleaned up after the previous tenants had moved out so it could be rented to new occupants when the cleaning crew found a box in the shed that contained what appeared to be human bones. Missoula Police Spokesperson Sergeant Travis Welsh claimed that there was loose teeth and what appeared to be a bone from a lower jaw. The remains were sent to a lab to be analyzed and the results were shocking. The bones belonged to three children, one between the ages of five and eight, one between the ages of six and 10, and a third between the ages of two and four. This is the tiny two bedroom cottage on a residential street in Missoula, Montana. The house vacant since last September when the old tenants were evicted. The property owner hired a professional cleaning crew to scrub the place from top to bottom. When the cleaners started going through this shed in the backyard, they found a box and made a horrific discovery. This was obviously something the Michigan State Police needed to look into because at the time of the their disappearances, Andrew was seven, Alexander was nine, and Tanner was five. The remains were sent to a lab in North Texas in December of 2017, but it was discovered the bones did not belong to the Skelton brothers. In fact, the Montana samples appeared to be over 99 years old and had been buried for some time prior to being uncovered and exposed to the elements. John Skelton was watching this news coverage of the potential break in the case from prison, and he wrote to a Detroit news station that he was not ready for an interview because since the news had gotten around the prison, many of his fellow inmates had begun calling him a monster and a child killer and threatening to, uh, you know, make him pay for it. He felt his safety was jeopardized, <laughs> but get this, remember, John Skelton claimed he handed his kids over to these strangers and then he just never heard from them again, so he didn't know where the kids were. He didn't know if they were safe. He claimed later that he regretted doing this because he just didn't know what had happened to his sons after this. But then he also claimed when he heard the news about the bones with the corresponding ages, he rolled his eyes and said, yeah, those are not my boys. I am still processing all the negative stories about me on the news a few weeks ago. I am not ready for an interview. Those news stories really jeopardized my safety and quite a few people no longer speak to me. When I asked John what his first reaction was when he heard about the bones, he said, when I saw it on the news, I just rolled my eyes. When I pushed him further, he said, yeah, those are not my boys. So I guess my question would be, how could he be so sure? If he truly had no idea what had happened to them, how could he be so sure that the bones were not connected to his sons to the point where he would roll his eyes about this discovery? Could it be because he does know exactly what happened to Andrew, Alexander, and Tanner? 
and he was certain that he hadn't left their bodies in Missoula, Montana? I want to go back to journalist and author Lynn Thompson for a moment, the man who wrote the book 76 Minutes about the Skeleton Brothers case. He took it upon himself to drive around Holiday City, Ohio and kind of scout out uh, different locations, like isolated locations that these boys might be. He'd been following the case since the beginning and he'd heard a rumor that one of the searchers had discovered an abandoned stuffed animal in a ditch near a gated tractor trail half a mile away from a large culvert two miles north of Holiday City. And remembering John Skelton's story about how he had tenderly wrapped his boys in blankets and handed them each a stuffed animal before sending them away with the Amish Avengers, Lynn checked out the area. He drove through the open gate and followed the trail into the woods back towards a river. Now these woods were privately owned and although the search team had brought sonar to that river, they'd never really come into those particular woods since they were privately owned. He said at that point there was no houses, no power lines, no reason why anyone would ever go there. Lynn figured out that this was County Road 0.30 and it had been abandoned since 1956 after it was damaged in a flood and it was located only 2.4 miles from Holiday City, Ohio. Lynn didn't really know how John might have found out about the area, but if you were looking for someplace to put bodies where they would never be found, he couldn't really think of a better one. So Lynn brought his theory to Steve Towns, the Williams County Sheriff, who verified that it had been an FBI agent who'd found the stuffed animal the same night the Amber Alert had gone out. He couldn't be sure of the exact location the stuffed animal was found, but he knew it was somewhere along US 20A near the St. Joe's River Bridge and a rusted out gate, the same gate that Lynn had gone through and walked down the trail. So they actually performed a search on this area with a canine dog, who did not pick up on anything, but then again, this dog was not trained to identify a cadaver sense, and even if he did smell something, even if he did smell a dead body, which most likely he would because he's a dog and they're amazing smellers, he wasn't trained to alert his handlers that he'd found something. He was a drug sniffing dog. So if there'd been, you know, some uh, cocaine laying around in the forest, he would have found it, but most likely not any dead bodies. They did find something strange and, and somewhat out of place, however. They found a baseball in the woods, sitting on a tree stump. It looked hardly used, but the lettering was faded from the elements. The words could still be made out. It was a 2010 Spalding Little League t-ball. They had the ball tested, but the results came back inconclusive. No fingerprints or DNA could be found on it. When Lynn suggested that they go back into the woods with more people and actual cadaver dogs, he was told there just wasn't enough manpower or time, especially on the basis of a reporter's hunch. At this point, Steve Towns told Lynn, look, you know what we know. There's a couple little details we're never going to tell you, and that's just the way it's going to be. We're protecting the integrity of the investigation. They're little things. They're not game changers. You know everything else. Still, Lynn could not get that little t-ball from 2010 out of his head. The coincidence was too unsettling for him to ignore it. It was an area that clearly no one ever really appeared to go. It wasn't just discarded as if it had been thrown. It was sitting neatly on a tree stump, as if someone had carefully placed it there and then walked away, maybe to use as a marker, a trail marker. The baseball was from lot number 15450, and after calling around the sporting goods stores and Walmarts in the area, he discovered that none of the local places sold them. He was told they weren't an off-the-shelf item, so Lynn called Spaulding's corporate office in Kentucky and asked if any t-balls from that lot number had been shipped to Morency, Michigan in 2010. He was transferred to their public relations team who informed him that he had no proof any Spalding product was involved in a crime. So, I mean, basically what he's thinking is, does this ball belong to one of the Skeleton Brothers? Does this t-ball have some sort of significance? It's from the same year that they went missing and it's sitting out in these woods close to where John Skelton's phone pinged the night they went missing. So all he wanted to know from Spalding was, yo, did you guys like make these balls and send them out to Morency, Michigan? Because it would be a special kind of order item. It wouldn't be something that you could just walk into like a Walmart in Rancy and buy. And they pretty much were like, we have nothing to do with this. Like, just forget you ever knew our name. Like, don't talk about us anymore. 
It reminds me of how nervous Nike got after the whole Heaven's Gate thing because they were wearing those uh, Nike Decade shoes and they kind of wanted to like distance themselves from the case as much as they could because they did not want their shoes to be connected to such a horrible event and that's pretty much what I think this company was doing here. So Lynn had to then call the director of Michigan's Little League who informed him that the Spaldings were quite pricey and they were only used for tournaments, not regular season play. Like they wouldn't use the Spaldings during practices, they just used them during um, you know, actual tournaments. Could this baseball have been a marker for John Skelton? Something that might seem innocuous to a passerby, but would be recognizable to him if he ever wanted to return to the place that he'd left his sons. And we also have John Skelton's foot injury, which continues to bother me, continues to just kind of sit in my brain, eating away at me. At first it was a foot injury, then it transformed into a broken ankle, according to him. He got it at first when he was trying to hang himself and then he fell. Now he doesn't want to tell us the details of how he actually hurt his foot. How did John injure his foot or his ankle that night? Especially if he retracted his story about attempting to take his own life and falling 10 feet. Could he have twisted it while disposing of bodies in the dark over rough and uneven terrain? And why did he go to an Ohio hospital 38 miles away in another state when there was a hospital four blocks away from the house he lived in? Even John's own father, William Skelton, never believed he had ever tried to kill himself, saying, quote, he's got more character than that. I don't think he's ever really been suicidal. Attention getting to get stuff going? Yeah, I wouldn't doubt that for my son, end quote. John's father, William, pointed to the fact that John had been a Boy Scout, and he was also in the Army, and he was adept at tying knots. If he had really wanted to hang himself and get the job done, he wouldn't have failed. According to Dr. Charles Felix, who works in the emergency room of a hospital, falling from 10 feet would have caused a displaced fracture where the bone snaps into two pieces and the ends no longer line up. A fall from that height would have also affected the lumbar spine, which would lead to compression fractures along the vertebrae. Skelton wouldn't have been wearing a soft shoe cast, and he certainly wouldn't have been discharged so quickly if that was his diagnosis. A soft shoe cast is going to be more likely used in the event of hairline fractures, which occur commonly after an ankle twisting or rolling, which is what I believed happened because he hurt his foot while he was carrying his sons through the woods or into some isolated kind of overgrown area, in my opinion, allegedly. I truly believe the only person who knows what happened to Alexander, Andrew, and Tanner is John Skelton, and he's never talking, especially now in August of 2020, when he's currently meeting with the parole board to discuss his potential release. According to the Michigan Department of Corrections, John Skelton could be paroled as early as November 29th of this year, and no later than November 29th of 2025. So unless something earth-shattering comes up, some undeniable evidence, John Skelton will be a free man at some point within the next five years, and that point could be as early as just a few months away. And that's incredibly disturbing for me. There's no justice here for these three boys who were just out trying to live their lives, be kids. They were pulled into this horrible uh, divorce and custody battle that they wanted nothing to do with. They didn't sign up for that. And they were pulled in to the web of a father who cared more about himself than anybody else. And although his family had backed him up for years, they recently seemed to be coming to the realization that this is not the hill to die on. They professed forever that no one will listen to John's side of the story. No one cares about the truth. Yet when they're asked for the truth or for his side of the story, they refuse to talk to anyone in the press. So it seems a little counterproductive to be accusing the media of a bias when you won't talk to them. And don't get me wrong, the media is extremely biased. Mainstream media is extremely biased and that's just the way it is. There's always a narrative, there's always a side they're gonna take. I understand that. But in this kind of situation, if the family of John Skelton, his mother, his father, his sister, if they were being open and talking to the media about this alleged other side, if they were talking, if they were giving different information, if they were giving a different side to things, it would make sense why they were upset that the media wasn't reporting on it, but there is no other side to give. John's given his other side, his multiple other sides. Um, he dropped them off at a truck stop with some strangers that uh, this Joanne Taylor woman took them so that he could you know, hang himself in peace. That the Amish came to his house with fur coats and, and took the kids to be fostered with them. 
story after story after story, none of it which makes sense. Nobody's come forward. I believe a reporter from Michigan actually went to an Amish community because there are many Amish communities in that area um, and in Ohio and, you know, you know, around there. There's a lot of Amish and Mennonite communities and things. And she actually went there and she said, would this happen? Would, would you guys take in a child when you know that their parents are out there looking for them? And they pretty much said, no, we, we wouldn't do that. I think they would call the, probably call the police or someone. So John Skelton's story about dropping the boys off was starting to sound even more far-fetched than ever. But this was just one person's opinion. We read a lot of papers, yeah, as far as we know, we know what's going on. We, know we stopped off at a farm yet. just yeah, off a main know, road. We meet Jason, know, who's open and inviting. My mom told me you can go ahead and look at the house. You want to? Sure, if she's willing Absolutely. to. Jason tells us his father built this home and his family has lived here their entire lives. Hi, hello. We're greeted by Jason's family. They show us around their home. They show us their newspaper, the budget, and we start talking about the Skelton case. How probable was you know, it the like, Amish would take other. these boys in? And I don't think that we would, anyone would do that. No, our churches and families, we're all together. Listen. Everybody knows what everybody does. We're all back and forth, and yeah. I, I don't believe so. But that would be strange if all of a sudden there'd be three boys in the area, and everybody would be wondering what there was. Yeah. I wouldn't yeah. say anybody would yeah, take them I've in and hide them. I've been here all my life, and I've never heard of something like that. The long and short of it, my opinion, my conclusion on this is he was very, very mad at his wife. Even though he was the one who was planning to take the kids and like run to Florida, he was he was upset with her that she got upset about that and made moves to take full custody of those kids. That's when he started to feel powerless. That's when he started to feel out of control. Then he was asking her, you know, for weeks and months afterwards, when are we getting back together? When are you going to move back in? When are we going to be a family again? Because he realized he'd messed up and he wanted to kind of just erase the past and go back to when they were fine and normal and good. But she couldn't do that. And if you've ever been in an argument with somebody like this, they've done something to hurt you, you're not ready to forgive them. And they say they're sorry, but you say, that's great, I'm glad you're sorry, but I am not ready to forgive you and move on. And then they get mad. They get mad because you're not ready to be over it. They want you to be over it. And they don't want you to take your time. They don't want it to be on your schedule. You need to be okay with it on their schedule. They're manipulative. They're controlling. They're sorry as long as you're playing along with their little game. They say sorry, you say it's okay, and you move on. If they say sorry and you say, I need more time, they get angry. And that's the reaction of somebody who's incredibly controlling and narcissistic. And you can see this in the way he left their home, the home that they lived in as a family, the home that they'd raised three children in. He he made everything in that house unusable. He cut the cords to the appliances. He sliced the mattresses. He broke the dishes. He broke her cabinets. He wanted to make sure that she would never be able to utilize that house again. He wanted to make sure that there was nothing in that house she could find whole and good. And that is why he took those kids. He took them from her because he knew that was the way to hurt her. And he knew that was the ultimate way to just um, break her. And, you know... Like I said, Tanya has her own issues in the past, and, and we're not here to talk about that, but what I do see in her is a strength that I don't think I ever could have had. Um, I was just talking with my oldest daughter about this on the phone yesterday, that I hear these stories of, of families or parents who lose one child, but then you hear these stories of families and parents who lose all of their children. The Tan family case was one we talked about years ago on this channel where th where all of their children were, were killed. And this is another one, obviously. And then you have the, the Susan and Josh Powell case. I don't understand how somebody can find that strength to go on with their lives after that. I don't think that I could. So I, I see a strength in her that I don't know where it came from. I don't know how she is going on, but I have a lot of respect for her because she didn't crumble and she didn't crash and she didn't give up. And that's exactly what he wanted her to do. And maybe that's where her strength came from, knowing that what he wanted was to see her break. So she refused to. That is going to be it for this second and final part of the Skeleton Brothers case. As always, I would love to hear what you, what you have to say about it, what you think about it in the comments. Share this video if you think it's worth sharing. Like it if you liked it. 
Follow me on Instagram and Twitter to be more up to date with cases I'm currently following. And as always, thank you guys so much for being here. Don't forget to check out Scentbird if you're interested in trying new perfumes, new colognes, and new scents every single month. Click the link in the description box and get 30% off your first order with the code HARLOW30, H-A-R-L-O-W-E-3-0. I really love, I really love it. You guys have to try You or Someone Like You. It's my new all-time favorite scent. I love it. So remember to check that out in the description box. Thank you so much for being here. Stay kind, stay beautiful, stay safe, and I will see you very, very soon. Bye. So you got to let it go I got blood, blood on the strings